Hello and welcome back to the series on Python and neural networks for the purposes of the digital humanities. If you're just coming to this video fresh, I encourage you to go back and watch the previous videos in which I talk about neural networks and I explain how to create and prepare and label data for a binary text classification problem. In the last video, we created all of these functions that allowed for us to essentially prepare and label and break up our data so that it can be processed by a neural network. In this video, we're gonna focus on two steps. First, we are going to create the model using Keras and TensorFlow, and then we are going to use those libraries to train the model that we create. And so let's go ahead and just jump right in. So the first thing that we're going to do to have a reusable uh, kind of function, we're going to create a function so that we can kind of create the model and make adjustments to it uh, as we test and uh, look at the results of our model during training. And this is going to be called uh, kind of fine tuning the model. So we're going to do a def and we're just going to create a model function called create model, very creative. We're not going to pass in any arguments. We're going to say model is going to be equal to Keras dot sequential. So we're calling that sequential model. And I talked about the sequential model in a previous video. There's two different ways to really do neural networks in Keras, and uh, sequential is the simpler of the two. And that's what we're going to be using in this series. So what we're going to do is we're going to start adding layers to the model. And we can do this in a couple different ways. I'm going to do this by uh, doing each layer on each individual line. Uh, because I think it's easier to read and it makes a lot more sense for uh, newcomers to Keras to see what's happening. So we're going to do model.add and we're going to add specifically a dot layer, Keras dot layers dot embedding layer. Now the embedding layer is very important. Uh, this is where the neural network is looking at all of the incoming vocabulary. And this is where the neural network is going to start vectorizing and uh, performing word embedding. And this is essentially how the neural network is going to be able to understand text numerically and understand, in theory, meaning of words based on proximity to other words, frequency of usage, etc. So this layer is going to take two arguments. It is going to take uh, essentially the size of the embedding layer. Now this first digit here, this first integer is going to be the uh, the breadth of the vocabulary. So how many words are in your vocabulary? Now I've already done some testing. I know that 15,000 is gonna be perfectly fine uh, for my task here. So I'm gonna just put 15,000. If you're getting an error, um, it might be because your embedding layer is too small for your vocabulary. So in some cases, I try to increase the embedding layer to 100,000, just so that I know I'm not going to hit into any uh, vocabulary errors. But I know that I've got vocabulary for about 15,000 words, so I'm going to stick with 15,000 right now. This next number is the, the depth at which uh, the model is going to understand those words. So these are the dimensions of those words. And this is what we call the shape of the embedding layer. And so that's going to allow for the model essentially to understand words, 15,000 words, each of those in 25 dimensions relational to one another. And those are going to be our word vectors. And if there's uh, an interest in talking about word vectors, I'm going to be addressing word vectors a lot more in another series I'm preparing on uh, how to train word vectors and how to create word embedding models using Gensum, the Gensum library. So that's going to be the, the first layer of our neural network. The next, we move past the embedding and we start working on uh, kind of the, the hidden layers now. So we're going to say uh, keras.layers, we're going to add a global average pooling 1D layer. Now, this allows for the neural network to essentially flatten the data and, and understand it uh, more quickly and process it more efficiently. There's a lot of different ways to do pooling. Uh, sometimes they increase... If Sometimes they increase your accuracy, sometimes they don't. Um, and it's important to kind of experiment with different pooling layers at this stage. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to add in another layer. And this layer is going to be uh, keras.layers, as you might expect. And this is going to be a dense layer, the most common layer uh, in pretty much, I think, all of keras. This is the one that's going to be used the most frequently, especially for uh, text-based problems. In image-based problems, you're going to see convolutional layers. But we're going to get to that in a later video. So for right now, we're going to just pass in one argument here and one 
other keyword argument, which is going to be our activation function. And this is going to be the size at which the uh, the network is going to process and interpret words, and so the dimensions of it. And then this is going to be the actual activation function that we apply to it. I've spoken about activation functions in a previous video. If you forgot what they are, uh, what they do essentially is the uh, the mathematical way in which we are going to process the data in a layer. And so we're going to pass in the ReLU function there, the activation function. Next, we're going to add in another layer, keras.layers.dense once again. And we're going to pass in another activation function. And uh, we're going to pass in ton. I've never known how to say it, so somebody please correct me in the uh, comments down below. If you do know, I've always just said ton. <laughs> So we're going to do keros dot, uh, sorry, model dot add, and we're going to say keros dot layers once again. And this is going to be our final dense layer. Uh, and this is going to uh, have a size of one. And this is because we're trying to get the information into this, essentially uh, an output that is uh, going to be singular. So it's going to tell us if um, something is Oscar Wilde, zero, if it's Dan Brown, one, et cetera. So it's going to assign these numerical values using the sigmoid activation, which is a pretty common uh, final activation when you're doing a binary text classification problem because it is going to uh, interpret that data uh, uh, kind of in a binary way. So that's what we're going to do there. And then finally, we're going to do model.summary. It's going to tell us everything that we actually need to know about it. And I've got to add one other uh, parentheses there. And I knew that because summary wasn't changing to uh, blue as it was supposed to. And finally, we're going to do model.compile. And this is going to allow us to actually compile the model. And we're going to say optimizer is going to be equal to Adam. We're going to say loss, which is going to be our loss uh, function. It's going to be binary cross entropy. Now, there's a couple different things you could choose here. I'm choosing binary cross entropy uh, just because, well, first of all, it's kind of an introductory uh, loss function, but also because uh, this is kind of what's in the Keras documentation. I'm trying to follow that as closely as I can with adjustments for what I know works best for binary text classification problems. And finally, we're going to pass in another argument that's going to be metrics, and this is going to be a list. Make sure you have that list. And this is going to be accuracy, which is going to like kind of let the model uh, let us interpret how well the model's doing based on uh, a specific metric. And finally, this is going to return the model. So what's going to happen here, we're going to create the model, which is going to allow us to create a model and then return it and then create it as an object outside of this function. Now, before we actually run through and create the model, let's go ahead and create another function that's going to allow us to train the model. So this one's going to be a lot simpler. We're going to create a function called train model. That sounds nice. We're going to pass in a model to it. We're going to pass in a TT data, so that training data that we prepared in the last video. We're going to come up with the valuation size. For this video, I'm going to pass in the float of 0.3. So 30% of the data will be for uh, validation. And then we're going to say epochs is equal to one. We're going to adjust this when we actually call the function. Batch size is going to be equal to 16. The reason why I'm adding these extra keyword arguments is because this is going to allow for the function to be much more versatile as we try to fine tune hyperparameters during training. So let's go ahead and do the first object here is going to be uh, vowels. And this is going to be equal to int the length of TT data 01. So we're going to figure out how much data there is in total. And then we're going to multiply that by the val size. So we're going to basically create a validation data and base it around uh, however much data the user wants to see saved for validation. And so that can be 30%, 95%, whatever, whatever you want to do as you're kind of creating and tweaking your model as you train. So we're going to do another object called training data, and this is going to be equal to TT data dot zero. And then we're going to do training labels. So this is going to grab all those labels that we had in that training data that we saw in the last video as well. That's going to be equal to TT data one. And then we're going to have testing data, and that's going to be equal to TT data two. And then we're going to finally do some testing labels, and that's going to be equal to TT data three. So that's going to give us all of our training and testing data and labels kind of separated into different objects. Next, we're going to have our X validation, and that's going to be equal to training data. And we're going to do up until uh, kind of 
index that list up into the, the validation section. So that's going to kind of grab all of that, in this case, first 30% of the data and make um, our X uh, validation set and then our X train set. It's going to be training data, just the opposite, as you might expect, vals to uh, the end. And then next we're going to do Y val. And you'll understand what these are all for in just a second. And we're going to do kind of the same thing we just did there. The train uh, training labels. We're going to grab all those labels now and up until vowels. And then for uh, X val. Oops, sorry. X, oh, sorry. Bleh. There we go. For uh, Y train. There we go. Training labels. And we're going to do, once again, as you might expect, the opposite. So essentially, this is going to grab all of, separate all of our data between the X validation, the X training, the Y validation, and the Y training. So we're just kind of grabbing the corresponding data from these lists uh, up until uh, where we want to delineate between the validation data and the actual uh, training data. And remember from my earlier videos, training data is the data that is used to train the model. And during the training process, the validation data is used to validate that it is in fact learning correctly. And then we have a separate set of data that we're gonna see in the next video called testing data that's gonna allow for us to manually test the accuracy of the model. So let's go ahead and now do the actual training line of code. And this is gonna be amazing. You're gonna see that you can train a model in literally one line of code. So fit model, this is the way to do it. F-I-T lowercase model with a capital M. It's gonna be equal to model.fit. And here's where we're gonna pass in, oh, all of our data. So we're going to say X train, Y train. So we're passing in all that information so that it knows what to actually train on. Uh, and we're going to say epochs is going to be equal to epochs. So we're going to be able to call that in our keyword argument up here when we call the function. Batch size, this is going to be the size at which the model actually um, lumps data together so it can learn more quickly. And in a lot, of, a lot of cases, you'll find that as you change the batch size, you'll have different results. And this is because models learn differently based on the quantity of information that's being lumped together. Uh, there is a, you, some experimentation is good. Uh, I always recommend starting with 16 or 32 and working your way up or down depending upon the results. So validation data is going to be another argument, and that's going to be a tuple. And that's going to be X val and Y val. And then finally, we're going to say verbose is going to be equal to one. And then this is important. Shuffle is equal to true. I believe shuffle is default true. I always do it just so I can see it. Whenever there's a default keyword argument for something as sophisticated as model training, I always try to manually include it anyway, just so I can see it and have peace of mind. And shuffling your data when, tr when you're training is very important. It's going to help for the model not to just memorize uh, data in sequential order. It's going to actually learn the uh, the parameters and the uh, the attributes of the data, not the the order of it. Because remember, uh, models are lazy. Neural networks want to learn the best possible way and the easiest possible way. And memorizing data in order is always easier than actually trying to learn what the data is to figure out what makes it the corresponding label. So we're going to do model results is going to be equal to model dot evaluate and we're going to evaluate the testing data and the testing labels so that's going to allow us to actually uh, test that now and see how well the model actually performs so now that we got all of that done now it's time to actually call our functions and we're going to be able to do this with just two lines of code so the first one we're going to do is we're going to use a line of code to create our model. So we're going to say model is equal to create model. And here's the nice thing about uh, this is that's all you have to do because we've spent a good deal of time creating that function. That's all we have to do to actually uh, perform that task now. So another one we're going to do is train model. And this is going to be model equal to train model. We're going to pass in that model object that we created right here. And then we're going to say TT data is going to be equal to TT data. So we're going to call and bring in that function or sorry, that object up here, basically all of our training data and training testing data. And we're going to pass an epochs. And for this one, we're going to do 10. And then we're going to do a batch size that's equal to 16. And you're going to see a lot of stuff happen. Um, really, really quickly. This is Keras loading and the model being created kind of all in one go after all of this 
other stuff that we did where we're creating all the training data is all performed. So that's going to be what you see happening. And then what we're going to see is the model actually learning. We're going to see the loss and we're going to see the accuracy. So I'm going to just jump right in and do it. Okay, so I had my uh, recording software going as I was trying to call up Keras, and I kept on getting this error uh, that was not normal. So I think what was happening was I was losing some GPU memory. So I'm just going to kind of show you now in the mid process what we have going on. So we've got Epoch 1 being trained. This is the first generation of the neural network, and we can see a lot of different information. And each of these is going to be the amount of batches that we have. So we have 457 batches that are each going to be 16 in size because that's our batch size. And we see the loss that we actually have and the accuracy that we have. What, we'll, what we want to see during training is a comparable decrease in loss whilst we have an increase in accuracy. And if we're going down, we can see that that's actually, in fact, happening. And on the second generation, we see a huge increase. Accuracy at 100% is always alarming, but we see that that drops uh, initially in the second batch. So this is just a fluke where the model got 100% right. Uh, for whatever reason at this stage. If you start seeing 100% accuracy again and, and again and again, it's a good sign that your model is actually overfitting. And neural networks, seeing 100% is usually a bad sign. Models should not be 100% accurate because it means they're not going to be able to generalize very well. So if we keep on going down, we see that we're looking at a good loss uh, decrease while we're having a stable increase in that accuracy. And we see the third generation, the third epoch, it's gotten better. And this is kind of what we want to see. This is pretty standard. Uh, we're increasing now into the 96, 97 range while our loss is dropping significantly. This is all looking good. Loss is sitting at 0.8%, uh, 8%, uh, 96%. Uh, increase in around 97. That's where I kind of want to see it. And it's important to study this as you go through and it's already done training. So that's going to be how we actually train, create a model and train a model using Keras and TensorFlow. And what you don't see right now is that I've got a pretty good model. So this is the uh, the actual, uh, the testing, the amount of data that we save for testing. And it gives us a sense of how accurate it is. Now we didn't have a lot of testing data. Uh, that's not going to be important because I've devised a manual test for the model that, so it'll give us a sense on data that the model's never seen before uh, so we can kind of get a sense for its accuracy. And we can see that we're sitting around uh, around 89% accuracy here. Um, that's not great. And we're going to do some things to kind of tweak it as we study and look more deeply in the next video at what our model has actually learned. And what you're going to be surprised to see is that you can't tell right now, but this model's figured out what makes Dan Brown sound like Dan Brown, and what makes Oscar Wilde sound like Oscar Wilde. And we're going to see that in the next video. Thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed it, please like and subscribe down below. If there's something that you want to see on this channel, let me know and I'll start a series on it. Uh, and for, for the foreseeable future, this channel will be dedicated more and more to um, uh, textual-based problems that face the digital humanities. Thank you for listening, though. Have a great day.